Hello everyone, my name is Alison Clark and I'm a midwife here in the Parent Education Department at King Edward Hospital. In this discussion or recorded clip, I'm going to go through the 34 to 38 week education discussions from your pregnancy handheld record on page 22. The resources that I will be referring to are your Pregnancy, Birth and Baby book, accessible as a hard copy or as an e-book online from the public we uh, website and also the Breastfeeding Centre uh, webpage. This will be followed or followed up on by a 15 minute telehealth or telephone call to give you an opportunity to ask questions about your individual needs. Okay. Please have the book ready today, okay, and mark off things as we go through. You may want a pen to jot down any resources so that you can follow through on that before having the time with the midwife. By now, you should have already um, completed and signed consents for the screening tests, okay, for your baby. Information uh, relating to this is in chapter six of your pregnancy, birth and baby book. But the consents that I'm referring to, okay, are in the back of your handheld record, okay. Um, you may sign those at home or decline them as you see a fit. Um, the information um, explaining all of those is both in your pregnancy handheld record and online. Before we move to the 34 to 38 week second section, can I please just give you a little reminder about sleeping on your side. I'm sure you're all aware that you need to go to sleep on your side and we do not want you to be waking up uh, on your back. So there's information here in your book, okay? If you're finding that you are waking up on your back as well as popping a pillow behind your back and uh, pelvic area, you might want to take a bath towel, fold it in half long ways, then roll it up, secure it with an elastic band and tuck it behind you so that if you do wake up on your back, your pelvis is tilted and your baby is still assured of a good blood supply as is your brain. Okay, another thing just to draw your attention to is uh, your baby's movement. Okay, I want to draw your attention to page 24 and the common myths about baby's movements. I'm sure the midwife and the doctor have already spoken to you about this, but please read it clearly. And if you're concerned, you're going to ring the King Edward Maternal Fetal Assessment Number, which is on the front of your handheld record. Okay. We are also hoping that you plan to breastfeed your baby if you're medically able to. King Edward is a baby friendly hospital or accredited hospital I should say and follows the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. These 10 steps are, uh, sorry, are found on page 15, chapter two of your big pregnancy, birth and your baby book. Okay. We also um, would uh, refer you to chapter seven in that book, which is all about breastfeeding. Lots of information there. For those of you who haven't and would like to book to a breastfeeding class, you can do this through the Eventbrite website, okay, or scan the QR code on page 16 and follow the prompts on your browser. If you have chosen to use a breast milk supplement to feed your baby, please bring the formula of your choice to the hospital with you. You do not need to bring bottles or teats with you. Any questions regarding that can be answered in your one-to-one -one session with the midwife afterwards. Moving along now on the page down to water birth. So if you have a look to the 34 to 38 week section, okay, we can only cover certain things that are actually on this page, okay. So what I want you to do now is just to have a think about um, how you see your birth, okay. We're actually going to follow the order that's on the book, which is mm, not quite uh, as it should be, I think, but we'll follow that to make it easier for you to go through. So we'll start with the suitability for water birth. So um, you must be well, okay. You must not require continuous fetal heart rate monitoring during your labour, and your BMI, so your body mass index, must be no greater than 30. Uh, pre-pregnancy, okay? So you're allowed to put on some weight in the pregnancy, of course, but pre-pregnancy, okay? 
We would ask that you read all the information regarding water birth in your pregnancy, birth and your baby book, okay, before signing a consent with your midwife or the doctor. Please be aware if there's not a suitably accredited midwife available in labour ward at the time of your birth, you would be unable to birth in the water. Okay. All right. As we go down the list now, okay, um, we're going to come to the section which talks about falls prevention, preventing uh, healthcare associated infection and hygiene. <sighs> That's a lot. I'm sure we're all aware of all the precautions now because of COVID. So any updates to restrictions within the hospital will be on the web page, the public web page. Okay. Um, within the hospital, we ask that you bring some suitable shoes or thongs or flips to wear, easy to get on and off and not a trip hazard. Also to be mindful for those of you who will be going home quite early after your birth, the same applies at home. Okay, now there's huge hemodynamic and physiological changes to your body uh, when you have a baby, okay, whether you birth naturally or whether you birth by caesarean section. Okay, it can make you a little wobbly on your feet afterwards. So please take care getting in and out of bed. Push yourself into an upright position. Move your feet before you stand up. If your baby is unsettled and calling to you, just use your voice to talk to the baby, which will help calm them. They already know your voice. Okay. Um, if during labour you have an epidural in situ, be aware that if you um, cannot lift your legs, okay, you will not be allowed to get out of the bed. So that takes some adjustment and the midwife will be guiding you in labour and following uh, your birth. Okay, again, you must be able to lift your legs, move to the side before you're going to be able to stand. You need to take care, okay? So when you're in the shower, you use um, uh, the shower chair. If you're at home, you might want to put an outdoor chairs inside. In the hospital, there's also handrails to hold if you need them. Everyone is expected to sanitise their hands regularly. Oh my goodness, don't we hate COVID? So we need to be doing that. There's plenty of uh, dispensers around the hospital for both you, your essential support person, and also the staff. Okay. Latest updates to restrictions for visitors, okay, can be found on the website, okay. Can I also point out that um, if you have an unvaccinated uh, support person that they need to download the appropriate form and uh, uh, apply for uh, an exemption well before you're coming to the hospital. Can I just repeat that you need to download that form, complete and submit it well before you come to the hospital and there will be rules around what they can and cannot do within the hospital. Now moving down a little bit further um, when we come to um, the request for bloods, etc., for 36 weeks, some of you will have already been given forms by your midwife or your doctor to have bloods done prior to that 38 week visit. For some of you, you won't have those, it's all fine. We'll deal with that when you come to the hospital. And for rhesus negative women, they may be having some blood taken before they have another. Um, a dose of anti-D, okay, and that will be explained to you individually. Okay, uh, turning to page um, 48 in your great big pregnancy birth and your baby book, there's a whole section explaining group B streptococcus in pregnancy. So group B streptococcus is an organism which may or may not inhabit uh, the vaginal and the anal area, okay? We know that if a baby is to inhale that um, during birth, it can cause a nasty pneumonia in the baby. So what the guidelines are at King Edward are that we would encourage you all to do a low vaginal swab. It's like a big cotton tip. You're going to be doing it, not us, um, which goes into the lower part of the vagina and then around your bottom. Okay, we do it in that time around 35 to 37 weeks because it takes a couple of days for us to get the result back. 
Um, most women do not have group B streptococcus. About 10 to 30 percent do. So what we would like to do is to identify those women and with their consent, if they're positive, because of the potential effects to their baby, give them IV antibiotics for hourly in labour. You'll get a further chance to, um, to ask questions about this when you speak to the midwife one-to-one. -one. Okay, it is highly recommended that you do this. Um, if your baby is unwell after being born, just by demonstrating a faster breathing rate or a temperature, and we do not know your group B streptococcus, um, the guidelines are that we treat your baby with triple IV antibiotics. So please think it through, discuss it with those who are important to you and the midwife or the doctor before making a decision about that. Okay. So moving down from that, okay, I think we now can move on to the section that says discuss your home visiting plan, okay? So home visiting. As you're all aware, because of um, the possible implications of Omicron, we're going to be moving you home from the hospital as soon as possible, even earlier than might be stated in the book. So when you are going home, there'll be a whole list of things to check through, which is why it's great we have this little discussion beforehand, okay? For those of you who live within our home visiting catchment area, our midwives from the visiting midwifery service will be coming to see you. Their care will be divided between um, physical at your home and also telehealth, okay? So this is new because of Omicron, okay? So what we're trying to do is minimise the risk to our midwives and the time that they spend in the community and still supporting you, okay, as needed. All right, so I know that I'm talking to mothers who it might be their first experience and mothers who have other children. So when the midwife from the home visiting service comes to see you, we ask that it is just um, the mother of the newborn or newborns, if you're having multiples, who comes into the room with you. We ask that it's a safe environment, so please put your furry babies, your fur babies, dogs, even if they're little and they're outside, can you please have them away or contained uh, because many people are actually frightened of dogs, okay? And is it safe for us to come and visit you? Do you have 20 flights of stairs for us to get up just so we can make sure we send the right person to see you? Okay. Um, let me stop and think what we need to think about when we're going home. Do we have someone to drive you home? Do we have somebody uh, to stay at home with you? Have you got things set up at home? Do we have some extra food supplies in there? Do you have the phone numbers for supports? Okay, some of which are in the back of your pregnancy, birth and your baby book. So the breastfeeding centre number, um, telehealth, um, helpline, you know, your GP, thinking ahead about possible things that you would need. Please get um, basic food supplies in so that you can just relax and enjoy your baby when you go home, okay, and you're well prepared for it. Okay, now um, this seems a little bit silly, doesn't it? Because we're now going to move on to the birth and we've already been talking about what we're doing when you're going home. One thing I didn't mention was that our home visiting midwife supports you generally until day five, okay? For the community midwifery program girls, they're supported until day 14, but for um, the uh, women coming to King Edward, our midwife comes to you until day five. Sometimes that's extended, but then you're going to have the follow-up resources of the breastfeeding centre and also your child health nurse. So I'll come back to that in a minute. If we talk about your birth, okay, let me just ask you to think about how you see your birth. What do you need to prepare for your birth? Okay, so some of you will be, be planning um, uh, to come to the hospital and have an active natural labour. For some of you, you know you're going to be induced because of those uh, medical or health uh, impingements on the decisions for your birth. And some of you will be having a planned caesarean section. 
If I can go firstly to the girls having a planned caesarean section, okay, you will be given some uh, information, a little booklet uh, about your planned caesarean birth, what to expect getting in and out of bed, what's expected of your support person, how it is, what is anticipated for the baby after birth. Okay, there's also a little birth plan um, which you can fill in. Okay, so you have time to talk to the midwife about that and you also have an anaesthetic appointment prior to that which will be a telehealth or telephone. Okay, um, for those of you who are coming to birth vaginally at King Edward for the spontaneous labour, okay, just be reminded that the number to ring is on the front of your handheld record. When you come through to this number, okay, if you're asked which hospital, it's because the hospital uh, switchboard is shared between um, Charlie's or QE2 plus the children's hospital and us. So don't be put off if they say which hospital, you're at the right place. You'll be triaged through to a labour and birth suite or the maternal fetal assessment unit. Yes, very long I know. It's a senior midwife who will talk to you about your um, about your individual needs. So for the well woman with no complications, she will be staying at home for as long as possible, um, depending on where you live, uh, contracting about one every five minutes. For a woman who knows she needs to come to hospital because her baby needs to be monitored from early on, or she has some other health issues, she will be coming in uh, as directed by that midwife. If you are having an induction of labour, uh, you will have already had some information on a personal call about uh, the midwife ringing you, telling you when you're coming to hospital for that induction. So I hope that is clear. Okay, now what do you need to bring to hospital for your labour? The midwives in the labour ward have told me because of changes because of Omicron or COVID, please make sure your support person is well resourced. So um, whoever that is, if you're planning to use water, can they bring their um, thongs and bodies and a t-shirt and a towel because they're going to get wet when they're supporting you. They might also need a warm jumper if you have an epidural and they're resting overnight. We have nothing for them. We can't give them any resources to lie down on. So if they want to bring a little yoga mat or um, flight pillow or something so they can lie down on the floor to have a rest. If you're having a rest, can they please do that? We always encourage all support people to bring a pair of closed in shoes. Any woman birthing is at risk of having a cesarean section. And if we were to go to theater to birth our baby, your support person is going to put um, overclothes on, little shoes on, but they need closed in shoes. So during summertime, we tend to come in in thongs or flips or whatever, closed in shoes in the bag, plus the warm jumper plus some resources for them. So I'm meaning some food to keep them going. All right, so that's the support people. Um, for you, what do you want in your labor? Okay, so within the hospital, we have gym balls, we have peanut balls, which are just like gym balls, but great big peanut shaped things, which can help support you in labor. If you're planning to use the shower a lot, I would bring a little yoga mat or something to put underneath my knees because it's pretty hard down there on the tiles. You don't realize at the time until afterwards. Please, in your little bag, as discussed in uh, chapter five in the Pregnancy, Birth and Baby book, um, what do you want within your labor? Are you gonna bring an electrolyte place drink? Are you bringing herbal teas? Are you bringing some aromatherapy, which would just be on a cloth so that you can sniff it? Are you bringing your oils? Are you bringing cream for massage? You can wear one of our gowns if you wish to. You can wear your own clothes, whatever you would choose. For those of you who are gonna be monitored throughout labor, meaning that you would have two bands around your abdomen, okay? We do have some telemetry within the hospital, which is a wireless monitoring. 
even if you were not using telemetry, you can move a good meter and a half away from that equipment. So you can still be on the gym ball, you can still be active, okay? Um, and a little point for massage, if you need, if you're being monitored, you can't use creams because you can't get over the band. So some tennis balls or some soft stress balls are really good for your support person to be rubbing up and down your back. Okay, I would just like to also mention uh, optimal fetal positioning, which some of you may have heard of before. Optimal fetal positioning is something to start practicing in the lead up to your labor from about 34 to 36 weeks. We'll have some information attached to this talk so that you can see that. But basically it is keeping your hips higher than your knees in the last month of your pregnancy or six weeks. So the pelvis is tilted slightly forward till it's open here. And we what we want is uh, hips higher than the knees so that your little baby can rotate around into an anterior or a front lying position. So what we're hoping for is your little baby who will be head first, cephalic, vertex, okay, leading the way, okay, and we're wanting the widest part of the baby's head to go into the widest part of the pelvis. Around 36 weeks when you're getting all those Braxton Hicks contractions, this is what's happening for baby. So we don't want baby's back to be to your back because it means there's a larger section of baby's head coming down which makes it more difficult for you. So leaning forward encourages baby to come down in this position and be able to rotate forward okay both at the end of the pregnancy and within your labor so optimal fetal positioning okay uh, you can go to the spinning babies website it's not our website you won't have to pay anything to get some basic information but keeping the hips over the knees, okay? Really, um, with the gravity of you being upright, you have the force of gravity helping your baby to rotate around. Nature is an amazing thing if we give it a chance to work. So please work with nature. Okay, moving along now, because I imagine some of you are getting quite tired of me talking. Think about what's going to be happening for you in your labour, okay? There is a little suggestions for your birth plan on the page next to this section that I'm talking about, page 23. Fill that in as you're able to and talk that through with the midwife, okay, when you have the follow-up conversation, okay? So information regarding birth is in chapter 5, okay, of your pregnancy, birth and baby book. Um, discussions or questions regarding um, epidural or pharmacological pain relief, please have that with the midwife as we go through, but please read this information before, prior to that appointment, okay? It is very uh, helpful. Um, now birthing your baby, everyone talks about birthing the baby, but most people forget about birthing this beautiful thing called the placenta, which is what has kept your baby alive and allowed it to grow and kept it safe during your labour. Okay, so birthing the placenta is really very important and in your book it talks a little bit about third stage management. Okay, so third stage management you'll find on your birth plan it talks about active, modified active, um, immediate cord clamping, delayed cord clamping, and physiological. So there's a section in the book in chapter five referring to that. Physiological means uh, no oxytocic drug to help birth that placenta. And as states in the book, uh, this reduces your risk of blood loss following birth. Active management is something that we use for women who have a higher risk of bleeding. For example, low platelets or previous history of postpartum hemorrhage. So as soon as baby's birth, they're given IV or intramuscular oxytocic drug because of the risk posed to that mother. For most of you, we'll use modified active, so baby's birth, baby comes to mummy's chest for that full hour of skin to skin, and when the cord has stopped pulsating, um, they give you the oxytocic drug, clamp and cut the cord. For those of you who are um, 
um, uh, having their um, sorry lost four words here for those of you who are having their placenta preserved okay um, then you will have organized that um, with the person coming to collect the placenta and you need to sign a form because it's live uh, it's uh, human tissue for those of you who just wish to take the placenta home again you need to sign the form um, and then your partner or support person will be given that to take home on the day okay we do not store them you cannot come back for them later please have a look at it it's so interesting to see uh, what has grown your baby and kept your baby safe within the labor okay um, what else would you like to ask? Please write a list so that you can follow that up with the midwife in the talk. Okay. I've got a couple more things on the list here. The child health nurse will be given a book all about me, this purple back book. Every um, baby gets one of these when they leave the hospital. So within this, it's going to have your closest child health visitor uh, address okay so make sure we have your correct address when you're leaving some of you might be just down in Perth to birth your baby and then going elsewhere so that first visit is normally somewhere between 10 day 10 and 21 days following birth you'll be phoning to make that appointment your midwife will remind you of that the child health nurse is the person who supports you following birth they do the developmental checks on your baby they start the mother's groups and i'm sure that will be a combination of telephone telehealth and in person as time as we move through these next few months okay um, you need to visit the GP for your six week checkup so both baby and mum need to go to the GP mum needs to have what we call the postpartum check okay baby also needs to go baby is going to have their heart checked and their hips checked okay so um, make sure that you have a family GP that you know that you can go to and trust okay really important when you've got a new baby you do not want your GP uh, to be on the other side of town particularly if you've just moved okay that's not helpful so have a look around and get yourself a good family doctor close by They'll also talk to you about contraception. Uh, it's a bit overwhelming. We may talk to you about contraception before you even leave the hospital, which is a bit scary when you've just had a baby. Okay, so about page 84. Okay, there's a very busy chart with different forms of contraception. I urge you to think about it before you have your baby because after your baby, it's a little bit foggy and uh, there's lots going on. Okay, so we would like you to have at least a year between your babies. Okay, when you leave the hospital, we require you, or the law requires you, to have a fitted baby seat. Okay, so that would be in the form of a capsule or the rear facing uh, uh, 0 to 4 um, car seats. Okay, so make sure you have that fitted, make sure you know how to use that. We do not come to the car to check that for you. One thing that I have forgotten to mention, but it is right at the bottom of our list here, is um, discussion of prolonged pregnancy or induction of labour. So that is in the section before chapter five about giving birth. Okay, and that is uh, about page 56, if I remember, between 40 and 42 weeks. So let's go to page 54. Okay, so even though it says between 40 and 42 weeks, if you are 36 weeks pregnant and need induction because baby's not growing or perhaps the diabetes is unstable, the way we induce you remains the same. So depending on whether your cervix is ripe, okay, a bit like an avocado, or whether it's unripe, will dictate how the doctor will talk to you about that they can possibly induce your baby. Please read this information beforehand uh, so that you have time to absorb it before you're given that in a, a clinic appointment or in a, which can be brief because we're um, restricted to 15 minutes face to face with you now. Super important. 
Um, within your book is a section on safe sleeping for baby. Okay, we would like you to read this through very carefully. Okay, there is a website, um, it's in the bottom here, rednose.com.au. Please go to it, have a look, it's got some other information there. But basically, baby is sleeping in a separate bed, cot, uh, cradle. Uh, next to the parents' bed in the parents' room, okay? Not directly under uh, a fan or a uh, air conditioning vent or a window. Baby is placed to sleep on their back in an uncluttered cot. Well-fitting mattress, no pillows, no bumpers, no toys, no mobiles, nothing extra around baby. Feet to the bottom of the cot. They may be uh, wrapped or um, using a little sleeping bag or swaddle. Swaddle meaning something that does not cover the baby's head. So sleeping baby on their back, head and face uncovered, keeping baby smoke free. We all know that smoking is not good for anybody. If either parent has smoked or is smoking, never co-sleep with your baby. Safe sleeping environment, day and night. Okay, breastfeed baby if you can. Okay, and we're sleeping baby in the parents' room because actually the noises we all make helps keep your baby alive. How to wrap your baby is on the next page. Please go through that. Um, again, on that Red Nose website, they explain very clearly how to wrap a baby safely. Some babies love to be snug, okay? Arms always across the chest, never down by the sides. I'll say that again. Arms across the chest, never down by their sides. And some babies just want to break out and sleep with their arms above their head. That is fine. So wrapping is firm, but not too tight for baby to escape if they wish to, okay? Please have a look at that. Discuss that with your support people and also grandparents or older others who may be helping you because in a previous time, some of the things we did were slightly different and have been proven to be unsafe. Whew. How are we? Are we nearly all done? One last thing I do want to mention is for women, um, who have um, diabetes and are on insulin, there will be specific information and a booklet given to you about antenatal expression of colostrum uh, in your appointment, either over the phone or when you're in here. For women who might have heard about it and wish to do it, I'm just going to direct you to some resources uh, through the Australian Breastfeeding Association. There are lots of um, reasons why we would not um, do antenatal expression, and that is going to be women who have a history of preterm labour, women who have a cervical suture in, women who have um, an incompetent cervix, and women who have a placenta previa. So please discuss this with the midwife in the follow-up phone call. So thank you for listening to me. Enjoy uh, your birth and your beautiful baby. Congratulations everyone. Take care. Thank you.